So I, I'm going to start with a story. It's about um, an architect named Roger Ulrich. And um, in 1984, he studied a, a small hospital in Denmark. And it so happened that in this hospital, 50% of the rooms had views out to nature, and 50% of the rooms had views of a, a brick wall. And most of the patients in this hospital were recovering from operations. And what he found was that the people with views of nature recovered 8% more quickly than those with a view of the brick wall. And what's more, they needed 50% less in the way of pain-relieving drugs. And um, in many ways, that was a defining moment for uh, biologically inspired design approaches. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to argue that biologically desi inspired design approaches will be the best source of solutions that will help us shape a really positive future and create buildings that are better for people, uh, the profit, and the planet. And there are two elements to this. There is biomimicry and there is biophilia. So biophilia, this was a, a term coined by a biologist called E.O. Wilson. And his hypothesis was that because humans had evolved in direct contact with nature, there was a lot of evidence to suggest that people are happier, healthier, and more productive if they're in regular contact with nature. And uh, this has now been implemented in all sorts of uh, environments. This is a hospital in uh, Singapore that is showing even better results than uh, the one studied by Roger Ulrich. And I mean, it's partly about filling the building with plants, but there's a lot more to it than that. It's also about looking at biological forms, uh, natural materials, acoustic comfort, and so on. And there's a, a really fantastic opportunity here to improve all our working environments. And personally, I would love to do some experiments with a client who was willing to just try out on half of their office space, say, uh, using biophilia, and then measuring the, the difference in productivity between that and the other half, and then hopefully doing uh, the whole lot. So the second part of this is uh, biomimicry. And um, if biophilia is more about sort of design and psychology, uh, biomimicry is more about uh, design and uh, function. So this is probably the best known example of uh, biomimicry. And uh, the story here was a, a doctor called George de Mistral, who took his dog for a walk one day. And the dog came out of the bushes covered in these little seed burrs. And he took one home and looked at it under a magnifying glass. And that's what he saw. And that was the origin of Velcro. Uh, George de Mistral was the guy that invented Velcro. So biomimicry is really about looking at how things work in nature and then translating that into solutions that suit human needs. And I'll give you another couple of examples. Uh, this one, this is a, a beetle that can detect a forest fire at, depending on who you believe, somewhere between 10 and 80 kilometers. And if you look at conventional human-made fire detectors, they have a range of about 8 meters. So this is about 10,000 times as sensitive. And what's more, it doesn't need a continuous connection back to a power station burning fossil fuels. You might wonder why the hell would a beetle fly towards the fire? Well, it actually flies to where the fire has just passed through, and there is a kind of popular science explanation for this, which is that when it gets to where the fire has just passed through, all its mates are there, it can have unlimited sex with no predators around, and you don't get much better than that in the beetle world. <laughs> but the, the, the more serious point is that we could learn from this to create much better fire detectors for our buildings and potentially much better fire detection for our forestry. Uh, this is another good one. Uh, some of the beetles have the best tricks. Uh, this is a, it's called the bombardier beetle, and it fires a high temperature explosion out of its rear end. Uh, some men would probably like this uh, superpower. Uh, it, it, it mixes together two high explosives, uh, and in its mixing chamber, it has valves on the opening inlets, uh, which open and close 200 times a second. And this has inspired better ways of uh, uh, new forms of um, uh, fuel injection systems in engines, needle-free medical injections, and a new type of uh, fire sprinkler that uses about a tenth of the amount of water. And then uh, there's a lot that we can learn from shells. This is abalone shell, which has quite an amazing microstructure built up out of all these layers. At a chemical level, that's 95% identical to ordinary blackboard chalk. But because of this microstructure, it achieves 3,000 times the strength. 
And uh, in my office, we turned this idea into a house for a, a client recently. So based very much on the same ideas, uh, using curves to create strength and then a structure that is almost identical to abalone shell uh, to give it uh, phenomenal strength. And uh, we were quite pleased with that. Uh, the client decided he didn't like curves, which was a bit of a setback. So, uh, you know, if any of you fancy a new house, see me afterwards. So um, there are ways, uh, I think, of using biomimicry in a sort of behavioral way. It's mainly a functional discipline, but I'm going to show you an example of, it, of how it can be used in a behavioral way. Three years ago, my office was very short of work. We were pitching for a project in the Middle East, and, and we really had to win this one. Uh, we were going to be in trouble if, if we didn't. And so we went uh, much further than we normally do in looking at who was going to be ultimately making the, the decision on this project. And uh, we established that it was uh, a sheikh who uh, was most passionate. The thing that he got most excited about, the kind of love of his life, was camel racing. So we thought, can we uh, use that as the design starting point for this project? Uh, I'm calling this the Biomimicry Museum because uh, I can't actually tell you what the, the real project is. But anyway, let's just go with this for now. And um, we, uh, we did find a way of using camels to design this project. And there were three basic ideas. Uh, there's camels' nostrils, there's Persian ice making, and there's solar cooling. And, and so I'll explain each of these. Starting with camels, uh, camels are quite amazing. You know, they're, they're often derided as a horse derided by committee. Uh, designed by committee, but it's so disrespectful. They, they have amazing noses. If you look at a section through a camel's nose, it has these very intricate passageways called nasal turbinates. And as the camel breathes in the dry desert air, those surfaces evaporate moisture into the air to cool it and humidify it so it's less of a shock to the system. And then as the camel breathes out, that warm, humid air now passes those same surfaces which are cool because of evaporation. And the effect is that a lot of that moisture is condensed and recaptured by the camel. The small amount of moisture that it loses in the, in the air that comes out, it gets evaporative cooling benefits from that, so it can keep its brain and eyeballs as much as 6 degrees C cooler than the rest of its body. So we thought that was quite fun. And then the, the second one, uh, Persian ice making. The, the easiest way to explain this is to just look at some comparative temperatures. Let's say the temperature of the desert at night is about 30 degrees C, which is quite cozy. The temperature of outer space is minus 273 degrees C, which is a bit nippy. And on a clear night, you can get a black surface to radiate heat to outer space. And this is what the Persians did, the ancient Persians. They would put down a bed of straw at night for insulation. They put a shallow ceramic tray on that with a black glaze. And then last thing at night, they put a thin layer of water in it. And on a clear night, that radiative effect was enough to turn that water to ice. The third element that I mentioned for this project is solar cooling. And um, this is more conventional. Uh, it's based on using high performance solar collectors, evacuated tubes, which can produce really high temperature water. And you can actually use that as an energy input to a bit of kit called an adsorption chiller. And what's quite cool about that is that instead of putting electricity in, you put heat in. And on the hottest days, you get the maximum cooling output. All right, so three ideas. How do we turn that into a building? Well, essentially, it was about creating kind of a clever roof based on camel's nostrils and Persian ice making and so on. And during the day, we would have louvers that keep the sun off it. And then at night, we would open these up and the roof would be allowed to radiate heat out to outer space. That would make the underside slightly cooler. And then what we want to do is we want to maximize the surface area, like the camel's nostrils, and maximizing the surface area for condensation. Uh, so we created these sort of elaborate fins, like the nasal turbinates. And we applied to these uh, a mesh that has already been optimized for water collection. And then to get even more uh, water making uh, power out of this, we would put solar cooling through those fins. And when the humidity rose, as it often does um, in the evenings, we'd get a lot of water condensing on those surfaces. And that would run down uh, to little channels, and we could uh, uh, collect that. In terms of the form of the building, we, um, we didn't want the air that was close to the ground, because that would be picking up 
uh, heat from the ground. We wanted the air that was slightly off the ground, and that suggested some kind of a, a wind catcher, a scoop. But we were also told that this might have to form a kind of entranceway to an, another building behind. So we were thinking about some kind of really grand archway that would celebrate your, your entrance. And then putting these two forms together, the scoop and the arch, it led to this Pringle shape. So the idea was this, this was a large roof which would be uh, supported above a landscaped terrace with an amphitheater in it. And then the whole of that roof surface would be our camel nostril water collection surface. The water would run down to a channel, channel in the middle and then we could have a theatrical little shower of rain when the concert was about to start. And uh, this is a sketch of, of how that looked. So it would be an amphitheater inside um, a, a, a kind of oasis garden. And then that surface there, that's, that's the, the camel's nostril surface. Uh, this is how the scheme looked uh, a little bit later on. And um, we went through various stages presenting to more and more senior people until we presented the shake. And the good news was that he loved it and he gave us the go ahead. Uh, so we were starting to gear up, uh, building up the team. It was gonna be a huge project. And then, um, as bad luck would have it, a certain someone was elected in the US. And the person that was going to be pa paying for this project, uh, he depended for like a third of his business on trade with the US. So with the sort of chill wind uh, blowing through the Islamic world uh, after Trump's election, uh, the project got canceled, which was a bit gutting, really. Um, so anyway, uh, that was another view of it. So we sort of uh, licked our wounds for the next year, and then they came back and said, well, you know, we ought to do something. Maybe we'll do something about a tenth of the size. So we did a new scheme for them. Uh, this was based on biological structures. And the only feedback we got on that was uh, the sheikh likes the inside but not the outside. Oh, and could you do it for a quarter of the price? So that was a bit frustrating. Uh, anyway, then we started looking at abalone shell, and we developed uh, ideas like this. And we were thinking, how can we get camels back into this? You know, that, that was the winner. How can we do this? And then one of my colleagues said, well, what about, um, what about that biomason material? So uh, this is a, ma a material. It's gone into production now. It's a brick that you can make uh, by mixing sand with a certain type of microbe that produces calcium. And all you have to put into it um, as a feedstuff is urea. And it's being done uh, with uh, pig urine. Uh, it might sound like a crazy idea, but it, it actually works. It's a very cheap and low energy way of producing bricks. And we started thinking, well, what ha which animal has much more concentrated urine than pigs? Camels, yes, fantastic. So um, we thought this was a winner, but um, you know, sadly, uh, the client didn't go for it, uh, which is such a shame, because I, I was really looking forward to the conversation with the project manager, who was a, a very conventionally minded guy, and he was gonna be saying, are you seriously telling me you're gonna build this out of sand and camel piss? Yes, we are, absolutely. So that was uh, an example of using biomimicry in a behavioral way, trying to sort of tap into the kind of things that would make people make the kind of decision you want. Uh, with mixed results, uh, obviously, it would have been much better if they'd gone ahead and built that. And um, now I want to say a, a few things about uh, when I think nudges work and when they don't work. So I think nudges at their best are examples where, with a small intervention, you can achieve a really substantial change in behavior. And my favorite example of this is from a council called Odeby and Wigstone Council. And about 10 years ago, they were having a serious problem with uh, bill posters. Uh, they were making the town look messy, and they were spending a lot of money on taking down these uh, flyers. And uh, it got to the point where there was a kind of crisis in the council. And there were some people saying, well, we can't afford to keep on doing this. We're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds. And there are other people saying, well, we can't afford not to, because it's going to uh, have a negative impact on the town. Um, a, a sort of classic oppositional uh, debate. And someone, he, I can't track down the person who did it, but uh, someone came up with the absolutely brilliant idea of in, instead of spending thousands of pounds on paying people to take these down, they would spend about 10 quid on printing cancelled stickers. And when the posters went up, this actually happened, the posters went up, they would just stick a cancelled sticker across it. And this was so successful that the people putting up those fly posters started taking down their own posters because they didn't want word to get around that the comedy gig, the car boot sale or whatever had been cancelled. I mean, it's just, just fantastic. 
Um, now, uh, nudges at their worst, I think, are examples of small interventions that don't really get to the root of the problem. And uh, th these kind of nudges, I think, are favored by NIMTUs. How many of you have heard, by, heard about a NIMTU? No? Oh, okay. Well, it's similar to a NIMBY. So, you know, NIMBY is not in my backyard. NIMTU stands for not in my term of office. There, there is a more extreme version, uh, which is bananas. Uh, bananas stands for build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything, which is frustrating for an architect. But anyway, NIMTUs. So NIMTUs, they, they favor kind of nudges, which means that it, it looks as though they're doing something about a problem, but in truth, they're just kind of passing the buck uh, on to the next person. And uh, this, for me, is an example of a sort of NIMTU type nudge. It's been shown that if you have a, a sign showing a, a smiley face if you're within the li speed limit and a sad face if you're over the li speed limit, apparently that is more successful than just showing people's speed. And yes, it would make a small difference, uh, but really, if you, if you think about the tiny level of difference that this would make in terms of overall reduction in fatalities, it's just not going anywhere near far enough. And what I'm going to argue in, in the, the next part of my talk is that we need more sort of transformative approaches. And in this example, I would argue that the kind of thing we should be doing is creating schemes like this. This isn't one of mine, but I think it's a very nice scheme. It's in Brighton. And uh, this achieved a roughly 90% reduction in car use, uh, which resulted in lower obesity, cleaner air, much greater levels of social cohesion, really getting to the root of, of the issue, which is about uh, how dependent we are on cars. And actually, if we design our environment so we're far less de dependent on, on cars, we don't have to use nudges. We can use transformative approaches to deliver a much greater overall uh, benefit. So now uh, turning to a couple of examples of uh, transformative approaches. The first of these is, is one that we've been working on called the Zero Waste Textiles Factory. I guess you could use nudges to encourage people to make uh, wiser decisions about the kind of textiles uh, they, they use, but I, I really don't think that's going to be getting to the root of the problem quickly enough to address the kind of challenges that uh, we need to address, particularly in developing parts of the world. This uh, project is going to be in India. And uh, what we did here is we got together a really good team of people, so not just a normal team of engineers and architects, but also a biologist, a water expert, and a green chemist. And we looked at all the, the issues of, of why textiles are such a dam damaging industry. And then we tried to use biological principles to, to rethink this. And I'll, I'll go through these quite quickly, but this is a comparison of conventional human-made systems with uh, the characteristics of biological systems. So ours tend to be simple and disconnected, whereas biology is complex and interconnected. Biology works on closed-loop zero-waste principles. It's adapted to constant change, doesn't use long-term toxins, runs entirely on solar energy, is optimized as a whole system, and very importantly, is regenerative rather than extractive. And I think that right-hand list is actually a, a very good summary of where we need to be going to, to transform our, our cities and industries and buildings, and to, to really transform from the industrial age to the ecological age of humankind. We can achieve a certain amount with nudges, but I think a lot of this is going to take more uh, shoves, uh, transformative approaches. And we, uh, working with the, the green chemist, we, we managed to design out all the, the toxins uh, from the waste handling, uh, sorry, from the, the dyeing process. What that means is you can then use biological forms of treatment to treat all that wastewater. And that delivers secondary benefits. So by having these long uh, planting strips between the two parts of the building and big picture windows, it meant that everyone in the factory would get good amounts of daylight and they would get views out onto nature uh, that would produce the kind of biophilic benefits that I was talking about early on. And uh, this is what the building would look like inside. So instead of it being a, a, a windowless space, this, this would be flooded with natural light, the views out to nature, and uh, overall get a much better result by really taking a transformative approach, getting to the root of the problems, and producing a scheme that would be 100% solar powered, uh, close to zero waste, 
um, and a much better working environment for people. And, and all that with a, a roughly six year payback period. And from that point on, it would be a much cheaper factory to run than a conventional one. The final one I'm going to talk about is uh, an office building. And you know, office buildings can be absolutely hellish. They can be really gloomy and depressing. And they don't have to be that way. And it's going to take more than a table football table to improve quite a lot of our working environments. Um, so here, we again, we got a really great team together. We used uh, biomimicry to completely rethink the challenge of, of office design. And in the first uh, workshop we had, we concluded that daylight was likely to be one of the biggest drivers of the architectural form, partly because of human well-being and partly because it would save energy if we could make this largely naturally lit. And with our biologist, we looked at examples of how light is gathered and distributed in biology. Uh, what I'm drawing here, this is the eye of a spookfish. And the spookfish has amazing mirror structures in its eyes, which focus low levels of biolum bioluminescence coming up from the ocean. And those mirrors focus that light onto the, the retina. Another one we looked at is uh, called the stone plant. So this is a, a type of plant that lives in deserts. And for reasons of thermal stabilization, most of the plant lives below the ground. Um, and it has what you could call a roof light that uh, allows the light to come down to the basement where the chemical reactions can take place at a steady temperature. Another one we looked at is the brittle star. And this is a starfish that lives as much as 500 meters below the ocean surface with very low light levels. And it's evolved a covering of lenses over its skin uh, that are near optically perfect. And those are able to detect and focus very small amounts of light and movement so it can see predators before they see it. And these examples, and actually many others that we looked at in biology, encouraged us to think much more creatively and deliberately about how we would bring light into the office space. A fairly conventional way of designing for offices is to just think about the right distance between the window walls. And uh, in London, you can find a lot of examples of offices that are 25, 30, even 40 meters deep. And you know those are going to be very, very high energy buildings uh, because they'll be artificially lit and air conditioned. So what's the right dimension? Well, we reckon it was about 12 meters. So no one is further than six meters from the nearest window. And then thinking about what this implied in terms of a building form, uh, we could just take those narrow floor plates and stack them up into a tower. And that would be fine already. Blimey, I'm going to have to speed up. Uh, but we, we wanted to uh, look at a number of other building uh, forms. Uh, so we looked at a ring of office space around a central atrium. And then we looked at a more linear approach. And it was the linear one that seemed to work best. And when we looked at the daylight using software, we found that we were getting this curved pattern of daylight. Uh, this is looking at the building in plan. We're getting this curved pattern of daylight because of the shading effect of the opposite block. So the next move was to simply bend those floor plates so we get a very even quality of light all the way along. Uh, but this produced two further challenges. The first was that narrow floor plates aren't very good for creative clusters of people. We need some spaces that are wider. And this also wasn't making very efficient use of a rectangular site. So then learning further ideas from biology about surface area to volume optimization, we elaborated this plan form into this shape. So now we have much better facilities for creative clusters of people. No, still no one further than six meters from the nearest window, and it was making more efficient use of a rectangular site. And now looking at the building in section, still thinking about light, uh, we found it was reasonably easy to get enough light into the upper parts of the building. The challenge was how to get the light further down. And we looked at the possibility of harvesting light and focusing it into fiber optic tubes. And for this, we looked at a rainforest plant called Anthurium waraquinum, which has lenses that, on its leaves that do just that. Uh, so this has become a research project, which we hope will come back in in the next phase of the project. The main thing we concluded was that there was a, a good case for shaping the building. And we proposed that we would incorporate a large scale mirror in the atrium uh, that would focus light very much like the spookfish. Uh, that's the, the thing there. So that would bounce light uh, deeper into the lower parts of the building. And then looking at what we would do underneath that mirror, we thought this was a great opportunity to design a really dramatic meeting space 
that would add value to the building. And uh, if I had more time, I'd love to tell you how we learned from structure to save concrete, how we learned from termite mounds to design a self-heating and cooling system, how we learned from folding leaves and beetle wings to design a new sun shading system. And then that's how the scheme looks now. And uh, oops, that's got slightly out of order, sorry. Um, and um, that is a, a view of the atrium. So the same as with the, the previous project, the textile factory, this is a scheme that would be uh, using far less energy. It would be better for people. Uh, it would be an uplifting space to work in. And to draw together some conclusions now, I really believe we have all the solutions we need to shape a, a truly positive future. And sometimes a nudge will do. Sometimes uh, it's going to be a shove that's required. But either way, I think we'll find that a lot of those solutions are to be found in biology and through understanding more about uh, our human biology. People sometimes ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist about the future. And in many ways, I think that's the wrong question because that implies a sense of inevitability about the future. And I like what Hans Rosling says, which is that we should be neither pessimists nor optimists. What we should be is serious possibilists. We should decide on the future we want, and then we should set about creating it. Thank you very much.